a stone's throw out on either hand from that well-ordered road we tread and all the world is wild and strange churl and ghoul and gin and sprite shall bear us company to-night for we have reached the oldest land wherein the powers of darkness range from the dusk to the dawn the house of sadhu near the takasali gate is two-storied with four carved windows of old brown wood and a flat roof you may recognize it by five red handprints arranged like the five of diamonds on the whitewash between the upper windows bhagwan das the bunia and a man who says he gets his living by seal cutting live in the lower story with a troop of wives servants friends and retainers the two upper rooms used to be occupied by Janu and Azizun, and a little black and tan terrier that was stolen from an Englishman's house and given to Janu by a soldier. Today only Janu lives in the upper rooms. Sudhu sleeps on the roof generally, except when he sleeps in the street. He used to go to Peshawar in the cold weather to visit his son, who sells curiosities near the Eduardes Gate, and then he slept under a real mud roof. Sadhu is a great friend of mine because his cousin had a son who secured, thanks to my recommendation, the post of head messenger to a big firm in the station. Sadhu says that God will make me a lieutenant governor one of these days. I dare say his prophecy will come true. He is very, very old, with white hair and no teeth worth showing, and he has outlived his wits, outlived nearly everything except his fondness for his son at Peshawar. Janu and Azizun are Kashmiris, ladies of the city, and theirs was an ancient and more or less honorable profession. But Azizun has since married a medical student from the northwest and has settled down to a most respectable life somewhere near Bareilly. Bhagwan Das is an extortionate and an adulterer. He is very rich. The man who is supposed to get his living by seal cutting pretends to be very poor. This lets you know as much as is necessary of the four principal tenants in the house of Sadhu. Then there's me, of course, but I am only the chorus that comes in at the end to explain things, so I do not count. Sadhu was not clever. The man who pretends to cut seals was the cleverest of them all. Bhagwan Das only knew how to lie, except Janu. She was also beautiful, but that was her own affair. Sadhu's son at Peshawar was attacked by pleurisy, and old Sadhu was troubled. The seal-cutter man heard of Sadhu's anxiety and made capital out of it. He was abreast of the times. He got a friend in Peshawar to telegraph daily accounts of the son's health. And here the story begins. Sadhu's cousin's son told me one evening that Sadhu wanted to see me that he was too old and feeble to come personally, and that I should be conferring an everlasting honor on the house of Sadhu if I went to him. I went. But I think, seeing how well off Sadhu was then, that he might have sent something better than an Eka, which jolted fearfully to haul out a future lieutenant governor to the city on a muggy April evening. The Eka did not run quickly. It was full dark when we pulled up opposite the door of Runjit Singh's tomb near the main gate of the fort. Here was Sadhu, and he said that by reason of my condescension it was absolutely certain that I should become a lieutenant governor while my hair was yet black. Then we talked about the weather and the state of my health and the wheat crops for fifteen minutes in the Huzori Ba under the stars. Sadhu came to the point at last. He said that Janu had told him that there was an order of the Sirkar against magic because it was feared that magic might one day kill the Empress of India. I didn't know anything about the state of the law, but I fancied that something interesting was going to happen. I said that so far from magic being discouraged by the government, it was highly commended. The greatest officials of the state practiced it themselves. If the financial statement isn't magic, I don't know what is. Then to encourage him further, I said that if there was any jadu afoot, I had not the least objection to giving it my countenance and sanction, and to seeing that it was clean jadu, white magic, as distinguished from the unclean jadu, which kills folk. It took a long time before Sadhu admitted that this was just what he had asked me to come for. Then he told me in jerks and quavers that the man who said he cut seals was a sorcerer of the cleanest kind 
that every day he gave Suddhoo news of his sick son in Peshawar more quickly than the lightning could fly, and that this news was always corroborated by the letters. Further, that he had told Sadhu how a great danger was threatening his son which could be removed by clean jadu, and, of course, heavy payment. I began to see exactly how the land lay, and told Sadhu that I also understood a little jadu in the western line, and would go to his house and see that everything was done decently and in order. We set off together, and on the way Sadhu told me that he had paid the seal-cutter between one hundred and two hundred rupees already and the jadu of that night would cost two hundred more, which was cheap, he said, considering the greatness of his son's danger, but I do not think he meant it. The lights were all cloaked in the front of the house when we arrived. I could hear awful noises from behind the seal-cutter's shop-front, as if someone were groaning his soul out. Sadhu shook all over, and while we groped our way upstairs told me that the jadu had begun. Janu and Azizun met us at the stairhead and told us that the jadu work was coming off in their rooms because there was more space there. Janu is a lady of free-thinking turn of mind. She whispered that the jadu was an invention to get money out of Sadhu and that the seal-cutter would go to a hot place when he died. Sadhu was nearly crying with fear and old age. He kept walking up and down the room in the half-light, repeating his son's name over and over again, and asking Azizun if the seal-cutter ought not to make a reduction in the case of his own landlord. Janu pulled me over to the shadow in the recess of the carved bow-windows. The boards were up, and the rooms were only lit by one tiny oil-lamp. There was no chance of my being seen if I stayed still. Presently the groans below ceased, and we heard steps on the staircase. That was the seal-cutter. He stopped outside the door as the terrier barked and Azizun fumbled at the chain, and he told Sadhu to blow out the lamp. This left the place in jet darkness except for the red glow from the two hukwas that belonged to Janu and Azizun. The seal-cutter came in, and I heard Sadhu throw himself down on the floor and groan. Azizun caught her breath, and Janu backed onto one of the beds with a shudder. There was a clink of something metallic, and then shot up a pale blue-green flame near the ground. The light was just enough to show Azizun pressed against one corner of the room with the terrier between her knees, Janu with her hands clasped, leaning forward as she sat on the bed, Sadhu face down, quivering, and the seal-cutter. I hope I may never see another man like that seal-cutter. He was stripped to the waist, with a wreath of white jasmine as thick as my wrist around his forehead, a salmon-colored loincloth round his middle, and a steel bangle on each ankle. This was not awe-inspiring. It was the face of the man that turned me cold. It was blue-gray in the first place. In the second, the eyes were rolled back till you could only see the whites of them. And in the third, the face was the face of a demon, a ghoul anything you please except of the sleek, oily old ruffian who sat in the daytime over his turning lathe downstairs. He was lying on his stomach with his arms turned and crossed behind him, as if he had been thrown down, pinioned. His head and neck were the only parts of him off the floor. They were nearly at right angles to the body, like the head of a cobra at spring. It was ghastly. In the center of the room, on the bare earth floor, stood a big, deep brass basin, with a pale blue-green light floating in the center like a night-light. Round that basin the man on the floor wriggled himself three times. How he did it I do not know. I could see the muscles ripple along his spine and fall smooth again, but I could not see any other motion. The head seemed the only thing alive about him, except that slow curl and uncurl of the laboring back muscles. Janu from the bed was breathing seventy to the minute. Azizun held her hands before her eyes, and old Sadhu, fingering at the dirt that had got into his white beard, was crying to himself. The horror of it was that the creeping, crawly thing made no sound, only crawled. And remember, this lasted for ten minutes while the terrier whined, and Azizun shuddered, and Janu gasped, and Sadhu cried. I felt the hair lift at the back of my head, and my heart thump like a thermantidote paddle. Luckily the seal-cutter betrayed himself by his most impressive trick and made me calm again. 
After he had finished that unspeakable crawl, he stretched his head away from the floor as high as he could, and sent out a jet of fire from his nostrils. Now I knew how the fire spouting is done. I can do it myself. So I felt at ease. The business was a fraud. If he had only kept to that crawl without trying to raise the effect, goodness knows what I might not have thought. Both the girls shrieked at the jet of fire, and the head dropped, chin down, on the floor with a thud, the whole body lying then like a corpse with its arms trussed. There was a pause of five full minutes after this, and the blue-green flame died down. Janu stooped to settle one of her anklets, while Azizun turned her face to the wall and took the terrier in her arms. Sudhu put out an arm mechanically to Janu's hukwa, and she slid it across the floor with her foot. Directly above the body and on the wall were a couple of flaming portraits in stamped paper frames of the Queen and the Prince of Wales. They looked down on the performance, and to my thinking seemed to heighten the grotesqueness of it all. Just when the silence was getting unendurable, the body turned over and rolled away from the basin to the side of the room where it lay stomach up. There was a faint plop from the basin, exactly like the noise a fish makes when it takes a fly and the green light in the center revived. I looked at the basin, and saw bobbing in the water the dried, shriveled black head of a native baby. Open eyes, open mouth, and shaved scalp. It was worse, being so very sudden, than the crawling exhibition. We had no time to say anything before it began to speak. Read Poe's account of the voice that came from the mesmerized dying man, and you will realize less than one half of the horror of that head's voice. There was an interval of a second or two between each word, and a sort of ring, ring, ring in the note of the voice like the timber of a bell. It peeled slowly, as if talking to itself, for several minutes before I got rid of my cold sweat. Then the blessed solution struck me. I looked at the body lying near the doorway, and saw just where the hollow of the throat joins on the shoulders a muscle that had nothing to do with any man's regular breathing, twitching away steadily. The whole thing was a careful reproduction of the Egyptian teraphin that one reads about sometimes, and the voice was as clever and as appalling a piece of ventriloquism as one could wish to hear. All this time the head was lip-lip lapping against the side of the basin, and speaking. It told Sadhu on his face again whining, of his son's illness, and of the state of the illness up to the evening of that very night. I always shall respect the seal-cutter for keeping so faithfully to the time of the Peshawar telegrams. It went on to say that skilled doctors were night and day watching over the man's life, and that he would eventually recover if the fee to the potent sorcerer whose servant was the head in the basin were doubled. Here the mistake from the artistic point of view came in. To ask for twice your stipulated fee in a voice that Lazarus might have used when he rose from the dead is absurd. Janu, who is really a woman of masculine intellect, saw this as quickly as I did. I heard her say, Ash, Nanin, Farib, scornfully under her breath, and just as she said so the light in the basin died out, the head stopped talking, and we heard the room door creak on its hinges. Then Janu struck a match lit the lamp, and we saw that head, basin, and seal-cutter were gone. Sadhu was wringing his hands and explaining to anyone who cared to listen that if his chances of eternal salvation depended on it, he could not raise another two hundred rupees. Azizun was nearly in hysterics in the corner, while Janu sat down composedly on one of the beds to discuss the probabilities of the whole thing being a bunau, or make-up. I explained as much as I knew of the seal-cutter's way of Jadu, but her argument was much more simple. The magic that is always demanding gifts is no true magic, said she. My mother told me that the only potent love spells are those which are told you for love. This seal-cutter man is a liar and a devil. I dare not tell, do anything, or get anything done because I am in debt to Bhagwan Das, the Bunia, for two gold rings and a heavy anklet. I must get my food from his shop. The seal-cutter is a friend of Bhagwan Das, and he would poison my food. A fool's jadu has been going on for ten days, and has cost Sudhu many rupees each night. The seal-cutter used black hens and lemons and mantras before. He never showed us anything like this till tonight. 
Azizun is a fool and will be a Perdonishin soon. Sudhu has lost his strength and his wits. See now, I had hoped to get from Sudhu many rupees while he lived, and many more after his death, and, behold, he is spending everything on that offspring of a devil and a she-ass, the seal-cutter. Here, I said, but what induced Sudhu to drag me into this business? Of course I can speak to the seal-cutter, and he shall refund. The whole thing is child's talk, shame, and senseless. Sudhu is an old child said Janu. He has lived on the roofs these seventy years, and is as senseless as a milk-goat. He brought you here to assure himself that he was not breaking any law of the Sirkar, whose salt he ate many years ago. He worships the dust off the feet of the seal-cutter, and that cow-devourer has forbidden him to go and see his son. What does Sadhu know of your laws or the lightning-post? I have to watch his money going day by day to that lying beast below. Janu stamped her foot on the floor and nearly cried with vexation, while Sadhu was whimpering under a blanket in the corner, and Azizun was trying to guide the pipe-stem to his foolish old mouth. Now the case stands thus. Unthinkingly, I have laid myself open to the charge of aiding and abetting the seal-cutter in obtaining money under false pretenses, which is forbidden by Section 420 of the Indian Penal Code. I am helpless in the matter for these reasons. I cannot inform the police. What witness would support my statements? Janu refuses flatly. And Azizun is a veiled woman, somewhere near Bareilly, lost in this big India of ours. I dare not again take the law into my own hands and speak to the seal-cutter, for certain am I that not only would Sudhu disbelieve me, but this step would end in the poisoning of Janu, who is bound hand and foot by her debt to the Bunia. Sudhu is an old dotard, and whenever we meet mumbles my idiotic joke that the Sirkar rather patronizes the black art than otherwise. His son is well now, but Sudhu is completely under the influence of the seal-cutter, by whose advice he regulates the affairs of his life. Janu watches daily the money that she hoped to wheedle out of Sudhu taken by the seal-cutter, and becomes daily more furious and sullen. She will never tell, because she dare not but unless something happens to prevent her, I am afraid that the seal-cutter will die of cholera, the white arsenic kind, about the middle of May, and thus I shall have to be privy to a murder in the house of Sudhu.